president of the Inves Investment Club here at Notre Dame. I'd like to welcome everyone to the third annual Women's Investment Summit Stock Pitch Competition. I'm going to invite Lauren Thompson to come up to the stage for her introduction and to introduce the judges as well. On behalf of the team at William Blair, I'd like to congratulate all the participants in this year's student stock pitch competition. I learned there were 36 initial entries this year, which is an encouraging sign for the future of equity research. I'd also like to thank the co-presidents of the investment club, Colin, Jackie, and Maddie, for their hard work in mentoring and coaching all of these teams as well as completing the formidable task of narrowing the field down to the seven semifinalists. It was brought to my attention that the investment club portfolio surpassed 1 million in assets under management this year. Congratulations on this milestone. I'd also like to offer a, spe a special congratulations for the seven semifinalist teams who braved the stage to pitch their ideas and demonstrated sound support of their theses when responding to the judges' questions. I understand it was a tough decision in taking the field down to these three finalists. And, and finally, I'd like to thank the volunteer mentors, many of whom were teammates of mine, for their help in coaching these teams through their qualitative and quantitative assessments of these companies. And lastly, I want to express just how thrilled the team at William Blair is to sponsor Notre Dame student stock pitch competition in tandem with the 2022 uh, Women's Investment Investing Summit. Excuse me. This two-day event has garnered strong support and enthusiasm across William Blair and in particular among our investment teams. It aligns squarely with our firm's key priorities to take a very fundamental research approach as well as to provide women with the skill set, development, and education that enables success in this industry. We have been blown away by the young men and women that made up these teams in this process, and we appreciate the opportunity to have been a part of it. And now I'd like to turn the stage to the three finalists. Hi everyone, I'm Hope, a sophomore finance and violin performance major. I'm Julia, I'm a finance, Chinese, and business tech minor. And I'm Eileen, a sophomore studying finance and physics. And tonight, we'll be pitching Borg Warner and YSE BWA with the price target of $64, a 44% upside from its current share price. We'll first start with an overview of the company and the auto manufacturing industry before diving into our investment rationales, which are BWA's clean energy oriented growth strategies as illustrated by their charge forward playbook, steady revenues backed by patented technology, aggressive M&A activity leading to a US dominant position and ESG alignment. Now Eileen will present an overview of Borg Warner. So for a quick overview of the company itself, Borg Warner is a leading supplier to the automotive industry that is diversified through their variety of project products loyal customer base and global presence based out of Auburn Hills, Michigan, founded back in 1928. Moving forward, Borg Warner looks to accelerate the push towards electrification as they lead the auto parts manufacturing industry. Julia will cover now. So the auto parts manufacturing industry has gone through so many changes, but we're most excited for the push for electrification. We have seen a growth of 8% in the EV market, and analysts predict that the electrification portion of the automobile industry will grow, which is why we believe the time to enter the market is now. Lastly, we want to highlight that Borg Warner's blue chip stable companies are looking to expand their electrification portfolio. With Borg Warner offering top tier electric solutions, we believe this is the perfect time to invest in BWA. Furthermore, Borg Warner's leading position in this industry is demonstrated through their top financial ratios. Their EV to EBITDA multiple, EBITDA margin, ROA, ROE, and gross profit are all best in class compared to industry peers. Looking at their retention ratio graph, you can see that 71% of BWA's net income is reinvested in the company's operations, signaling high growth prospects in the future. Finally, Warner's position as a leading ESG company is seen in direct comparison to their competitor, Vallejo. You can see that 85% of Borg Warner's 2020 revenue came from the sale of electric and emissions reducing products. 
Now we'll transition into our investment rationales. To begin, Project Charging Forward is Borg Warner's overall strategic plan as they accelerate their push towards electrification. So not only is Borg Warner themselves moving towards a more EV-focused business model, but so are their customers. And Borg Warner looks to serve them through their competitive advantage, unique electrification solutions, and M&A activity that translates directly to Borg Warner's growth itself. The EV market is growing with a CAGR of 8%, and Project Charging Forward sets goals for Borg Warner to capitalize on these by increasing EV-specific revenue to 45% of the total by 2030. The second part of our investment thesis stems from our steady revenue flow from four different channels outlined in our appendix. So now I want to direct your attention to the fact that over the past five years, Borg Warner has earned over 6,000 patents. We've highlighted three of their most recent accomplishments, including the EDM and IDM, which are used in the Ford and two new Chinese electric vehicle manufacturers, as well as the 800 volt SIC inverter, which is used by a German OEM, meaning if you drive a German car or like to drive a German car, you're probably utilizing Borg Warner's patented technology. The third part of our investment thesis stems from our aggressive acquisition strategy that is successful and best in the industry. Over the past few decades, they've acquired some of their biggest competitors, and they've showed they're able to seamlessly integrate these competitors into the Borg Warner value standard. We want to point out that in the past two years, they've acquired two of their biggest competitors in the electric space, and we believe that will push them forward into growth in the EV market. Finally, from a macro perspective, ESG investing is growing in popularity worldwide. As a leading ESG company, BorgWarner's share price will likely increase in the future as investors assign higher premiums. Before we conclude today, we'd like to address three key risks and mitigants. First, BorgWarner faces the form of non-traditional competition in self-driving and ride-sharing apps. However, historically, car sales have been increasing and are still projected to increase in direct correlation with the population growth in the future. Second, Borg Warner's operations are capital intensive, so a sudden drop in volume could translate to a significant drop in profitability. However, Borg Warner's diversified cash flow channels provide a hedge against such demand volatility, and their capital intensive operations create high switching costs. Finally, BorgWarner's commodity supply costs can be volatile, but we only view this as a margin headwind as their internal hedging processes decrease exposure to such volatility. Finally, to wrap everything up, we want to reiterate that we recommend a buy on BorgWarner with a price target of $64.14 with minimal downside and great upside due to their favorable business characteristics like their patented technology and M&A activity, as well as their charge forward playbook as Borg Warner pushes towards electrification. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation this afternoon. We would now like to open up for questions. Yeah, I can touch a little bit on the CEO of Borg Warner. Um, so he's been working at Borg Warner for over 30 years. He started in one of their smaller divisions when they acquired um, the Warner part of Borg Warner. They kind of acquired a 50 years ago, I want to say. Um, so he started there. He kind of worked his way up into the CEO position. He's currently on the board for the European Auto Parts Manufacturing like Industry, I want to say, overview board. And so he sits in a leadership position in Europe. He is also CEO of BorgWarner. So he definitely knows how to navigate this space um, and has known BorgWarner for such a long time. We're confident in his ability to especially acquire new companies into BorgWarner. aggressive acquisition strategy or their aggressive acquisition strategy. You don't really mention in here sort of what the returns on invested capital have been over the course of the company's history and what your expectations are with respect to um, maintaining that level of, of return going forward, given the fact that I, I'm not sure how much of your go forward expectations in terms of revenue or profit is really based on acquisitions versus organic growth. I can, okay, so um, yeah, so it's a really good point. I think there's 
the really big reason why we push for board one is there's organic growth and there's also the acquisitions. So I'll start with the acquisitions. They've been acquiring, you know, for a while. Um, the two most recent ones, because the 2020 deal actually ended in early 2021, and their annual quarter annual report comes out actually next Tuesday. So we're not completely sure on you know how the balance sheet kind of worked out with that. However, we're confident to say that they're good at creating free cash flow. And especially in their project charging forward playbook, they specifically mentioned they want to generate more free cash flow in case a new acquisition target does pop up in the future. Um, and then in terms of organic growth, we think that you know the market is pushing for it, consumer demand is there. So we're super excited to see that grow. I just had a question. Oh, excuse me. Um, I had a question on the relationship with their customers, the big OEMs, and just kind of how the, the dynamics work in terms of kind of they've got these big buyers and, you know, trying to leverage their bargaining power every year to get some sort of price concession. And so how does that typically work for BorgWarner and how does that play into kind of their earnings growth algorithm? Yeah, I'm happy to touch on that. So first of all, as we mentioned, BorgWarner has been around for a long time, since 1928 specifically. So during that time, they've managed to secure really strong, sticky, trustworthy relationships with their customers. And then their customers' growth translates directly into their growth. So for example, um, Ford is one of BorgWarner's biggest customers. They've been a customer since the 1950s. And Ford just announced the other day that they're planning to spend an additional $20 million in EV revenue. And then so that 20 million will translate directly into Borg Warner's revenues since um, Ford is such a strong customer. Um, and due to this strong customer relationship, that really solidifies Borg Warner's leading, reliable, top position in this industry. Um, could you talk a little bit about your view on the margins of the business going forward? You obviously have them in your model coming down quite aggressively. Could you just share a little bit more about the assumptions that you're making there? Yeah. Um, so if you go to their appendix, we have kind of like an annotated um, slide on how we kind of came with our projections. Um, so we actually took most of our 2021 sales based on their quarter three, which was actually 80% higher than last year. So that was a really good indicator that, you know, in quarter three, they had already achieved so many sales. So even in quarter four, they make absolutely no sales. Our base case is just so high considering in quarter three, they've already reported these numbers. Um, and then in the quarter three earnings call, actually, the CEO has mentioned that they're aiming for $14.4 billion in revenue in 2021. And right now our estimates are at $13 billion. So we think that we're actually going to be disproved by the earnings call on Tuesday, which is even greater news for why we're going to invest now. Um, and then in general, we're looking at a moderate revenue growth of about like 5% per year, a little bit more aggressive in 2022 to 2024, considering they have a lot of acquisition targets and they're looking to expand aggressively into a new rising market. I was just wondering if you guys can um, talk me through your price target. So when I look at the downside, you only have three and a half percent downside and an upside of 88.4%. So I'm just trying to understand, it's very rare that you see a stock with only 4% downside. So maybe if you could just walk me through what are the estimate, what, what needs to happen or what, 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 what have you what is in your downside? What risks, what's the worst case scenario? Where can you be wrong? Why is the downside only about 4%? And then on the upside, what are the things that are that are in the upside price target that are different from the base case? Yeah, um, so I can walk you through kind of the story that we painted as we were painting the downside case. So we kind of assumed that in quarter three, they just, in, or for the whole year of 2021, they just have the sales from quarter three. So we already started at pretty moderate assumptions. Then moving forward, we, in the downside case, so this is our base case, it's not up on the screen, but in our base case, uh, we estimated that the aftermarket or fuel injection will not grow at all because the, you know maybe people are not fixing their cars as often or you know any macroeconomic trend that can come up. Um, and so that's kind of how we projected the revenue by channel. And then in our base case, we also put our COGS percent of revenue at a high of 88%, which is extremely high. But we think that, you know, if the market does crash or commodity prices suddenly increase, we think that our base case covers for that particularly well, um, even in our downside case. And so that's kind of how we broke down like our expenses and things like that. And we worked a lot with like, oh, what if they increase R&D? And what happens if 
commodity prices go to the roof and it still had minimum downside. So that's why we really believe in the business. And then um, to go along with that, from a macro perspective, our downside case mainly rests on the assumption that adoption of EV will be slower than anticipated. Um, but this has actually just been disproven today, this morning actually, in which the White House actually just announced that they're spending $5 million on EV charging infrastructure in the um, U.S. highways. And so um, our, um, our downside case is actually really unlikely now due to recent news now. Um, on the risk side, we don't really talk about... We don't talk about the level of leverage and the, the duration of the debt versus rising interest rate costs. How did you think about that, especially as you have EBIT and EBIT margins coming down? I think the first part that we want to touch on is the fact that Borg Warner kind of has the purchase... Uh, price setting power in that they're manufacturing it. They have the patents, they have the technology, they have the engineers that can make what the, you know, the Volkswagen wants to make or the Audi wants to make. So first of all, that's a really valuable asset that they have. And, you know, a macroeconomic trend can't really take away from the fact that they have so many patents. Um, and second of all, we think that obviously there's a lot of comp competition going on and, you know, supply costs, supply chain issues are kind of rising now. But Borgwana has over 76 production plants around the world. So we don't see their global presence. So we don't see a big risk with, you know, oh my gosh, like a plant shut down here. But we have another plant in the same country 30 minutes away. We've got it covered. That was a fantastic way to uh, kick off the stock pitch competition. We're going to take a quick two-minute break and let the uh, judge panel introduce themselves today while uh, Team Signet gets ready to go. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Thompson. Um, you probably already heard, all, mostly heard from me unless you just got in. Uh, I'm from William Blair, and I'm an equity investor there. Hi everyone, my name is Deborah Netchert. I am a healthcare portfolio manager at Jenison Associates in New York. I've been in the investment world for uh, about more than half my life now, so. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Mala Gaukar. I'm at Sergo Capital, which I'm setting up after 24 years at Lone Pine Capital, where I was uh, co-CIO with Steve. Hi, my name is Laura Destrovats. I'm a portfolio manager at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, focused mainly on consumer and uh, internet. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Aversa. I'm with William Blair. I've been in doing equity investments uh, from a research perspective for, let's say, over 20 years. We don't want to get too specific. Um, and I have dedicated almost my entire career. I just sort of fell into it, but it's all been consumer. So it's nice to see everybody picking consumer stocks to talk about today. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to uh, welcome up Team Signet to the stage. Cool. Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Ollie Bernosik. This is Ben Norris and Patrick Feldmeyer. And we're really excited to pitch Signet Jewelers. Boasting banners such as K's, Ales, and Jared, Signet is an industry leader with an exceptional management team who successfully implemented an organizational restructuring, driving long-term sustainable margin expansion. This provides us with an incredibly attractive valuation at a blend of share price of $130 and a 55% upside. Signet is the largest retailer of diamonds in an industry that favors scale and is highly fragmented. Most of Signet's competitors are local mom and pop retailers who can't match them on a few key advantages. First, Signet's vertically integrated supply chain, enabled by significant investments in infrastructure and key supplier contracts and relationships, drive down costs and shipping times. Signet's omnichannel sales model meets consumers however they want to shop, and it drives higher price points and conversion rates. Finally, the company's balanced portfolio of banners hedges against macroeconomic uncertainty by meeting consumers across all price points in all segments of the jewelry market. Since the implementation of the company's path to brilliance restructuring, it has completely transformed from a once dying legacy mall-based brick and mortar retailer into an innovative, agile, consumer-focused and connected organization. To become more customer-inspired, Signet worked on differentiating their banners through better product differentiation and targeted advertising. To become more agile, Signet sold its receivables, eliminating downside balance sheet risk and boosting liquidity, and it's also managed its working capital far more efficiently. 
Finally, the company's omni-channel sales model has created a truly connected commerce experience. It drives higher conversion rates and price points. It enables flexible inventory management thanks to data insights provided on a national, regional, and local level. And it's enabled a 30% increase in advertising ROI thanks to data insights provided by the company's e-commerce platform. While management has stated their belief in restructuring success, we wanted to see how the CEO's vision impacted the company at a store level. We spoke with store managers from Kay, Jared, and Pearson to go to Banners. We found that all store managers buy into the omni-channel model. We spoke to the manager at Kay. She noted that before the restructuring, their sales strategy used to be a little bit pushy, but now all employees are focused on providing the best services possible. In regards to COVID, it actually served as more of a catalyst than as a detriment to the business, because at this time, the CEO let go of anyone who wasn't pulling their weight or who did not want to get with the times with the omni-channel model. In regards to this model, all store managers said that it is at the heart of all business decisions. And finally, we found that Signet is at the forefront of jewelry industry trends. Nowadays, younger consumers don't just want diamonds. They want lab-grown diamonds, sapphires, custom jewelry, and this is a plus for Signet. Because of their inventory flex flexible inventory management system, they can create a custom stone with a custom design and deliver it within days. This is how Signet has outperformed the independent jewelry stores, and this is how they've taken market share. The crux of our pitch is that their spike in revenue and EBITDA margins will sustain. Their EBITDA margin grew because by differentiating their banners, they improved their inventory returns by 50%. They also closed down their least profitable stores. Their revenue spiked because the omni-channel model is highly effective at generating in-store sales leads. Data from one banner indicates that 70% of in-store in business now comes from virtual appointments, of which 70% results in a sale that averages four times more than what a walk-in customer spends. In addition, their employee turnover is down 60%. A jewelry consultant with just one year of tenure achieves 60% more sales than a new team member. So yes, this omni-channel model is working, and we believe this will sustain because of a structural improvement in the business. For the past eight quarters, analysts have consistently underestimated Signet, its new management team, and its path to brilliance restructuring. The multiples at which it's trade indicate that markets still view the company as a dying legacy mall-based brick-and-mortar retailer, which we know is not the case. Finally, the company's share price moved in lockstep with other industry players such as Pandora. This highlights the fact that analysts may view the company's operational improvements and top line growth as a result of industry pull forward rather than durable changes. But this is not the case. Signet's growth in revenue and improvement in uh, margins was driven by a fundamental restructuring of the business, driving market share recapture and better store efficiency. Now, there are a few key investor concerns. First, is this revenue sustainable? Well, the omni-channel is proven to be highly effective at generating in-store sales leads. Number two, Leonard Green Partners has a $600 million preferred stake in the business, and investors are concerned of the stake's conversion to common equity in 2024. However, thanks to multiple anti-dilutive measures, such as their aggressive share repurchase program, and their ability to reissue and repurchase shares upon conversion with their cash on the balance sheet, we do not believe that this is a risk. Number four, what's going to happen with lab-grown diamonds? Well, as we said earlier, they are offering these lab-grown diamonds as well, but not in a way that cannibalizes their other sales. And finally, is this really a new signet? Well, primary research indicates that all store employees are buying into the omni-channel model. So yes, it is a new signet, with the model that's taking market share fast. Across all, in across all uh, industry benchmarks and our most similar comparables, signet is trading at a discount, despite recently capturing market share and margin expansion. When looking specifically at calendar year 2019 and last 12 months metrics, Signet is the only company to have significantly improved margins above pre-COVID levels, pointing towards a successful organizational restructure. While Signet has grown revenue over 40% year over year, we forecast revenue growth slowing to a near industry growth rate in all of our cases, um, considering macroeconomic uncertainty and potential industry tailwinds. We built revenue by banner, which included Q4 2022 purchase of Diamonds Direct, as well as by category, as shown in the graph below. It is important to note that revenue growth by category is mainly driven by recurring bridal sales, as well as small increases in the fashion market. Echoing the same narrative as our revenue assumptions, we forecast considerable, um, considerable uh, our EBITDA margins compressing, and we also, um, and this is seen in the graph right here. This is driven by our direct merchandise costs and increases in our compensation and benefits costs. More specifically, direct merchandise costs on average is 3% higher in our forecast period than it was pre-COVID, coinciding with continued supply chain pressures. Based, um, echoing the same narrative with our terminal assumptions and the conservative operational assumptions, 
We used a weighted average cost of capital of 9.4%, largely impacted by a 75% target equity weight in the capital structure. Our shares outstanding are sensitized across cases to reflect the dilution of the Leonard Green position, and our terminal assumptions remain cautious, with an EV to EBITDA exit multiple of five times, which is considerably less than historical EV to next 12 months EBITDA metrics, and a bearish 1% PGR. As Patrick and Ben have touched on, Signet is an industry leader with an exceptional management team that has successfully implemented organizational restructuring. With conservative top-line growth and bottom-line sustainability assumptions, we still arrive at this extremely attractive valuation. All across the board, Signet is undervalued, and now is a great time to capitalize on this upside. Really appreciate everyone listening to our pitch, and we'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Thanks, guys. Um, on the mall exposure that you talked about, and maybe I missed this, can you can you give us a sense of what what is the exposure to the mall? Is that the majority of the, the brick and mortar business today, and and then how does that kind of shift lower in their business over time? And then I guess the second question is, as you think about this as a restructuring, it's it's typically pretty hard to change the consumer perception of a brand. So I'm just curious as far as kind of what's gone wrong in the past that they're looking to restructure. Can you speak to consumers' perception and how you see that as having made progress on that kind of restructuring as well? So I'll take the first half of that question. Um, so before the restructuring, so you know, I mean, everyone knows, okay, everyone kiss, every kiss begins with okay, that commercial is going around. They're a very mall-based uh, legacy kind of brand. But with this restructuring, it was a connected commerce approach. So what they have now, if you go onto the website, Nowadays, if anytime anyone ever wants a product, they look online, it's the first place to go. Well, on Signet's website with each of their banners, they have 24 seven access to an expert jewelry consultant through text, call, FaceTime, they set up these appointments and that was drawn on by COVID. And these consultants are highly effective at generating in-store sales leads. And with this, there's higher transaction values and higher conversion rates. So that's how it's led to margin expansion and revenue expansion as well. Now, Ben wants to talk about the restructuring real quick. Yeah, uh, to speak a little bit more to your first question, um, another really uh, significant thing about the omni-channel model, as is seen you know, across the retail industry, is it's really turned stores into these mini distribution centers. Uh, Signet's built out its own last mile delivery service, and it has one day delivery within you know, a significant portion of uh, North America. Um, so it's basically using its stores to kind of have geographic exposure. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's like exposed to the downturn in malls because the omnichannel model has really uh, shifted the need for mall foot traffic. Um, so to touch to your consumer perception, you know, I think consumer perception is sticky. Um, however, because the shopping experience with Signet has fundamentally transformed, we believe it's pretty impossible to walk into a K or a Zales or a Jared and really not to understand this organizational restructuring because the way you're being dealt with is completely different. You're, you know, you have these virtual options to do in-store consultants through Zoom. You can even buy like maybe five or six items, try it on, and they'll give you a free refund for whatever you don't like. And they have one day delivery on most of their inventory. So, you know, I think they're, the, the shopping experience provided by this omni-channel model has really, will really shift consumer perception in the coming years. Hi guys, good to see you again. This is my team. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, you, you lay out a free cash flow build on one of your slides. And I just wanted to understand um, as you go, you think forward, you know, the business is obviously very different going forward than it has been historically. Um, and it looks like fiscal 22 is gonna be obviously an unusual year from a growth perspective. So as you look forward five years, what framed your sales um, sort of projections? What kind of assumptions were you making with respect to industry growth or the health of the consumer? Um, do you think that they've pulled forward demand that won't happen going forward? And then the third question is really related to profitability. It looks like the margins are sort of bouncing around a little bit. So I wondered if you could talk to what specifically your long-term view was in terms of profitability. Can it stabilize in that sort of 8% range or is that not the right range? Yeah, so kind of to answer that question, the first step is we kind of took the industry growth rate, which was three to 6%. That's how much the jewelry industry is supposed to grow. 
This year in fiscal year 2022, which ended like two weeks ago, they took market share. So they grew faster than the industry. And that's how like that's the long-term jewelry growth expectations. So we took through our base case and our bull case, we assumed that they were going to um, gain market share gradually above the industry growth rate. And our bear case kind of captured that like the industry was going to decline, a recession was going to happen, and they were going to lose market share, which is based on everything that we've seen is not going to happen. But something that we don't really account for in our bear case is that if that happens, they're going to eat up at the mom and pop shores market share, and that's going to help their future prospects, which is something we really underrealize in our value. <laughs> it's already broken. <laughs> So our um, EBITDA margins, next to talk about our EBITDA margins, we kind of first took into account that, you know, industry pull for it is definitely a factor of this year. Like consumer discretionary spending coming out of COVID has been like at all time highs. Like the younger generation, people are getting married. That's a big thing. That's definitely boosted revenue. That's why you see in 2022, 43% gain in a almost 13%, 12% EBITDA margins. But when you look forward, a big aspect is that we have a purchase, a $500 million purchase about a month ago of Diamonds Direct, which is going to assume to be immediately creative, but that's going to be something we see down the line, making a lot more of an impact. So we were definitely a little more bearish on that side. And then also we see direct merchandise costs, as we kind of talked about, them staying higher on average in our forecast period because we see supply chain problems persisting. As these guys have talked about, on a store level, the company has been largely unfazed by like, by inventory problems, like they've been able to get their diamonds. Like they dominate the whole, they dominate DBRs. They can totally move around their suppliers, but that still increased the direct merchandise costs. And we believe that that has been something that we see happening over the next three years. But then we see that recessing in our terminal years. So then we use that kind of, our terminal years, kind of like what we think of as like the future Signet and the most accurate base case future of Signet. And that still gives us like a 55% upside. Go backwards. All right, I'm Patrick Hogan. I'm Teddy Starr, and we will be pitching Dutch Bros with an upside of about 24%. So Dutch Bros is an operator and franchiser of retail locations that sell beverages, including coffee, energy drinks, and lemonade and tea. The company primarily operates in the Pacific Northwest, but is expanding nationally. And Dutch Bros is poised to benefit from key industry trends, including a focus on specialty beverages and a consumer dependence on caffeinated drinks. Dutch Bros has had really strong revenue growth in recent years, and this is mainly due to the company's uh, aggressive expansion with their store count. However, it is also due to their sustained uh, same store sales growth during COVID. And then just to note, uh, preliminary reports have indicated that same store sales growth in 2021 has been very strong at 8%. Dutch Bros also has had consistent profitability and this is mainly due to the company's high store level margin. So the first point of our investment thesis is that we believe the market underestimates the strength of Dutch Bros unit economics, specifically with their average unit volume, which is the average sales generated by an individual store. So looking at this table on the top left, you'll see management's guidance from the S1 from their IPO in September. 
um, showing very attractive returns on capital for new stores, even with conservative AUV estimates below current performance and trends in new states outside of the Pacific Northwest in the chart on the bottom. So one thing that we want to draw attention to is the 2.1 million average unit volume for 2020 and 2021 openings. We believe that there's a lot of momentum here and our upside is driven by our belief that Dutch Bros Union economics will continue to grow in the future beyond management's guidance of 1.7 million. And the primary drivers for this are essentially that the company has optimized uh, their store size. So typically in the past, their stores in Oregon were around 500 to 600 square feet. And now in the future, they're increasing the size of stores to handle higher unit volumes to be around 800 to 900 square feet. And they've seen very, very big increases in average unit volume in some of these newer states that have better economic growth prospects, such as Texas, and that's driven up AUV. The second part that we want to talk about is that the biggest concern for investors is execution risk as the company expands from 580, uh, 538 stores to around 4,000 stores over the next 10 to 15 years. And we believe that these unit level economics will remain durable as the company expands nationwide. And the first point that we want to touch on is that Dutch Bros is a very strong brand. They have uh, even superior pricing power to Starbucks and 60% of their sales go through their loyalty program. So they have a very highly engaged customer base and this brand has resonated with consumers. Also, we want to touch on their convenience driven model. Um, they have very large lot sizes for their stores with very small store sizes as I mentioned earlier. Um, this facilitates multiple drive through lanes at each location, which increases speed of service, which has resonated with younger consumers. And the last part that we want to touch on is that Dutch Bros is a specialty beverage focus. So they actually don't even serve regular coffee on the menu. And they focus only on specialty beverages such as uh, lattes and cold brew and alternative caffeinated beverages such as their proprietary Blue Rebel energy drink. And this fits with industry trends as Ty touched on earlier, where people are increasingly buying specialty beverages when they go out to a coffee shop and making regular coffee at home. So now looking at the risks and mitigants, um, there's a couple of things that we want to touch on here. The first is execution risk. Um, I, I, talked about this on the last slide, and we believe that Dutch Bros's differentiated business model will allow them to carry this business model nationwide. And we also talked to their head of investor relations, and they noted that they have no plans to expand north of Virginia over the next 10 to 15 years. So currently, they're not planning to expand to the most competitive market in the United States in the Northeast, where there's very dense uh, Dunkin' and Starbucks locations there. And the other part that we want to talk about is high ownership concentration. So Trav Borsma is the founder of Dutch Bros and TSG Consumer Partners was their private equity investor before the IPO. And they have very high ownership, but we believe that this is not a major concern because directors and officers have very high ownership concentration, which aligns interests with investors. And also as TSG sells off their position, this would create additional liquidity for the shares, which is a positive. So for our DCF analysis, uh, it's kind of covered, but uh, we use a two-step growth model with, as Patrick stated earlier, a total addressable market of 4,000 stores and an average unit volume of $1.9 million per store. We pair this with assumptions of an 8% weighted average cost of capital and 21% tax rate in order to reach an implied price target of about $69. We also completed an intrinsic TAM based valuation, again with a TAM of 4,000 stores and none of those stores being in the Northeast. Uh, we assume that this would be reached in 14 years, uh, just based off of the conservative side of management guidance. And then again, we assumed a $1.9 million AUV and then applied a terminal PE multiple of 27 times discounted this back at 8% and reached an applied price target of about $71. And so relative to its peers, Dutch Bros is trading at high multiples, uh, but this is mainly due to the company's high growth prospects, both in the near future and in the longer term. So our final price target for Dutch Bros is around $70 at 24% upside to the current share price. And we put 100% weight on intrinsic valuation because we want to capture uh, the firm's long-term growth prospects and we felt that the relative valuation um, is not particularly relevant because it doesn't capture those longer-term uh, growth prospects and our upside is primarily driven by the fact that 
Uh, we believe that there is additional upside for AUV at Dutch Bros's new locations as they expand nationwide and that these unit level economics will remain durable um, as they expand. So thank you and we can take any questions. So. Um, in terms of the, the restaurant economics, do you assume that um, the current economics remains stable as they continue to expand? So if you think about like the cost of real estate, is they're expanding into some of these other regions? Um, and how do you think about, you know, wage inflation, et cetera, and how that feeds into your model? Yeah. So, um, for expansion, we're, we're in our, in our DCF model, we're assuming that the economics remain stable as they expand for those 4,000 stores. So essentially what that means and what management is saying there is that they believe that there's 4,000, they can have 4,000 stores in the United States at those, uh, economics at those level of economics. Um, and in our model, we're assuming same source sales growth of 4% in our base case, um, just driven by that, that recent 8% um, number. We, we upped our, our same source sales growth from uh, what it was a couple of weeks ago due to that number. And for the wage inflation, um, we believe that that's not a very significant concern. And they have, actually haven't had very bad uh, employee turnover compared to a lot of restaurants. They've had around 50, 55% turnover compared to restaurant average of in the mid seventies. Um, and so they've been able to retain employees very well. And so we're not seeing like very significant, um, wage inflation above that over time. And then also to build on that with the wage inflation point, uh, they pay with, uh, or employees receive pay mainly through, I guess not mainly, but partially through tips. And so this has allowed Dutch bros to not have to increase, uh, base wages. Yeah, the drive through system is very similar to like a Chick-fil-A model where they're handing you an iPad to be able to um, make a tip if you want to. So there's like a, a customer service kind of um, side to it. And so people are seeing very high tips that are adding to their wages as well. So even if they're paying similar wages to restaurants, people are having higher take home pay because of that. Um, excellent job, guys. When you think about the when you think about them expanding, I guess two things. First is when you look at their when you look at the composition of some of their some of their drinks, it seems to just go towards one direction of super high sugar, super um, you know just down one direction. Have, are they making any moves to try to balance out the menu as they expand into other territories and to try to think about changing the menu? Does it need to be changed as they expand into other territories? And then just my second. My second question, we'll answer that first. Yeah, so I think um, the, a couple of things. Yes, there are some menu items that are definitely healthier that have been very successful. One of them is essentially a drink that's just like espresso shots with water that's actually been very popular. Um, so that would be kind of similar to like a latte except it's water instead of milk. Um, and they also have a lot of different options for customizing drinks. So um, people can swap out like milk say in, in a latte they could switch out milk for a different kind of milk so just like oat milk or something like that um, that could be healthier so there's more customization options that could allow people to um, make the drinks healthier and yeah I guess, is there anything else you want to add yeah they also have a cold beverage focus and because of their plans to expand into the southern parts of the united states this doesn't really uh like indicate that Dutch Bros will need to change its offering to like a hotter beverage uh, product. Yeah. And then just when we think about the valuation on the upside, same same question I guess that I asked the other group. What what is the down what is the downside? So when you look at, I mean, I guess valuation is really high. We can look at the market now. We can think about high multiple stocks. They're not really in in vogue at the moment. So I'm just curious when you think about the downside scenario. What are the what are the areas that you're most worried about? If it's a 24% upside coming in today, what is the risk on the downside and where could you guys be wrong? Yeah, so I think um, obviously they're projecting out very rapid store expansion. So I think the biggest concern here that we talked about a little bit in the presentation is just the, the execution risk of whether these economics are actually going to maintain as they expand so they can add as many stores as they want. But if they're not uh, maintaining these same returns, then um, that could be a big problem. And that's where we see the downside. So actually in our downside case, we have 11% um, downside. And what that represents is 
slightly slower um, store growth. So that's adding 112 stores per year instead of 125, which was their previous guidance. So they upped it for 2022 uh, very recently. So we went with their old guidance and then only one point million in AUV. And those are the those are the factors that the model is most sensitive to. So I think that the biggest thing that could go wrong is if they they can't add as many stores as they say they will, um, or if AUV falls, um, because those, those those are really what the model is most sensitive to. And we believe that AUV is not going to fall, just given that the trends in, in new states have been so positive um, compared to some of the more legacy states like Oregon and Washington, that that will continue to be true going forward. Just on the long-term unit economics, um, you mentioned kind of, uh, at least in the near term, trying to avoid markets where there's high overlap with Starbucks or Duncan. I think if I heard you correctly. So as you think about getting to 4,000, presumably they'll be in overlapping in a lot of markets. So just how do you think about that impacting their unit level economics? So you're saying uh, when they do expand into those regions? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think definitely the, the returns on the new stores we would expect to be lower. Uh, but at the same time, they are also slightly a different business model because they're lo being located in different places. So Dutch Bros is not locating um, stores in very urban areas. They're looking for more like suburban areas or rural areas that have uh, moderate pop population density because they're trying to have big lot sizes and it doesn't really make sense to have these big lots with multiple drive through lanes in like New York City. Um, so I think that the model will still be able to avoid the competition there by locating in different places, but also the returns of stores will probably be lower. Uh, but I mean, we're showing like 34% returns on, on stores in, in the current places that they are. But even if that's lower, it's still probably significantly higher than our WAC of 8%. And they'd still be creating value by opening stores in, in suburban locations in the Northeast. Um, there would need to be a really significant drop off um, in the profitability of stores for, for them to not be creating value. Um, I had a couple of questions that are not at all related, but following up on Lauren's question, um, the notion of trying to avoid Starbucks or competition, is that something that the company talks about or is that your perception of what is happening? I find it interesting. A lot of companies that, especially retail companies or restaurants, actually like to be where the good competition is because they tend to drive traffic and traffic is an important part of the model. So could you just talk about what the rationale behind that is? So yeah. I think I think that's not necessarily true across like the entire United States, just in the Northeast, they have specifically noted that that's not somewhere that they are trying to be in the near future. Uh, potentially later on, they would go there. Um, but yeah, I guess I mean, yeah, they they operate in locations that Starbucks and Dunkin and Pete's Coffee have locations. I mean, they're pretty heavy in Washington and in, in the surrounding areas, big cities like Dallas and Los Angeles. And I don't think it's necessarily that uh, they're not trying to compete directly with Starbucks and Dunkin, but they just don't feel the need to go up into the Northeast and don't think they're uh, like product offering will do like extremely well there. And then just not having to compete with that is an added benefit. Um, we spoke with the director of investor relations and he conveyed that uh, he feels confident that they can compete well in like the rest of the United States. And there's just not a need to, to go into the Northeast. Also like customer loyalty is really important for a lot of these companies. Um, like as we talked about 60% of their, sales are going through their loyalty program. So when people are choosing to go to one coffee shop, they, they typically are choosing to go a lot and very consistently. And that obviously plays into just the fact that people who consume coffee typically drink coffee uh, most of the time. Like a lot of people drink coffee every single day. So I think it's a little bit different from something like restaurants in that sense, where you may not want to locate right next to somebody because you want to be getting someone's business every day and having them enroll in these loyalty programs. And that's something that's important to Dutch Bros, but also Dunkin' and Starbucks. Okay, that's 
thanks, that's a good answer. Um, my second question is related to your 4% same store sales assumption going forward. Embedded in that, how do you think about tra traffic versus yeah. ticket versus, you know, product mix? So, um, I, and I, there's obviously like a price effect too. Uh, they didn't raise prices at all from COVID all the way until Q4. And then they raised prices by two and a half percent in Q4. So we haven't seen the entire effect of that in that 8% number from 2021. So a certain portion of that we believe will be price increases in the near term. And then um, obviously the rest of it would be more like volume. I think there's probably not a lot of room for growth in ticket size if the ticket size is already a little above $7 and it's above Starbucks. So I think it would be surprising if we saw really big increases in that going forward. So I think in the near term, there will be a price effect. And then um, there's been really big volume effects recently too, just given that there was an 8%, there, there was 8% growth in 2021, even with very minimal price changes, if you're looking at the whole year. So we would expect volume to be the biggest driver over our projection period. Okay, and then last question, sorry. <laughs> this is a good presentation. My last question is related to sort of the expense line items. So you commented about wages. I think I would have a different point of view on their ability to mitigate wage inflation given what's going on right now in this country. So I'm interested in sort of what your assumptions were as it relates to wages and other commodities going forward? And are you assuming that EBITDA or EBIT margins are moving higher from where they are today? Yeah, so what we were, so essentially what we were using was we were using like a bottoms up build. So we were taking um, what management said costs were for each store based on 2020 results. And then using that, we didn't adjust anything for COVID. We just like rejected all the COVID adjustments because we feel that they're so different across all the comps that it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, so we were using their guidance for each store. And then EBITDA margins are like expanding very aggressively um, because this is a growth company. They're taking a lot of startup losses when they're opening new stores. There's <clears throat> pre-opening expenses um, in addition to just like the, the CapEx. Um, there's around $140,000 uh, $140, in pre-opening expenses for each store. And so that starts to add up a lot. And then there's also lower margins on stores in the first year. We use like a two-year ramp system. Um, they said that the, the unit economics that we have in the deck here is second year. So we're expecting lower AUV in the first year. Uh, so they have much lower margins then. And then in the second year, it gets to maturity. So margins are going to ramp up like very significantly in, in our expectations and in our model. Um, just because of the startup losses and then just ramp in stores to maturity. Great talk, guys. Thanks so much. We're going to invite the, uh, the judges to join Aaron outside, I believe, to deliberate the uh, first, second, and third place finalists now. Um, I guess everyone hold tight for the next uh, two or three minutes. Um, so first of all, we want to congratulate all the teams on behalf of all the judges. You guys did, uh, you know, terrific work. We were super impressed by all of your stock pitches. Unfortunately, we were told we absolutely have to pick three, two, one. So um, I'll start with third place. Uh, we put Borg Warner in third place with Signet in second. And so congratulations to Dutch Bros first place. Thank you. 
we're going to start wrong. And we will take a uh, brief break until 5.30 um, when Mala will kick us off with our uh, investment keynote speech. So see everyone promptly at 5.30. Thank you.